Right. Um, I hope you can hear me from wherever you are watching from or listening from. This is Mayegun live, and uh, let's check the let's check our audio. Sorry, guys. I'm working on the audio from this end. Yeah, I think uh, the audio is back, so we can uh, we can continue. Sorry about that. But just before I continue, okay, I need to say this. Sometimes it is better to know who you are fighting and uh, what you are fighting for. Okay, we have a problem. I don't know if it is uh, human nature or what have you. But we have a problem as a people. Many, many of us don't think. And that is why most of the time, you are mostly interested in arguing. You want to, instead of you to have a conversation, you want to have an argument and see who can argue best, who can abuse who best. Meanwhile, the point of the conversation is lost on both parties that is why today on social media you see everybody eh? so many people grown-ups fighting themselves abusing themselves as if to say if they see themselves one-on-one -on -one, you should know what will happen matured people who should be having conversations they are fighting abusing themselves on social media then you begin to ask yourself it is so obvious now that uh, in so many homes in Nigeria, things are not working well. People's frustration are shown on social media, whereby people will leave a conversation and they will begin to attack themselves for no reason, day and night. Come on. If you're having a problem at home, if the frustration in Nigeria is making you get angry at everything, listen, you need to calm down, okay? You need to calm down. The same thing you are facing. There are others that are facing them too. People are not running mad on social media. Don't run mad on social media. 
Nigeria is a fake country. They have told you to love the country. They have told you to do everything to protect the country. But what they refused to tell you is that they didn't tell you that to build a country, it requires everybody, including those who are telling you to what? To build Nigeria. The question you should be asking yourself is this. Are those who are leading Nigeria too, are they in any way in love with the country? The answer is no. You may block your hairs, you know, you may block your hairs and then put some some wood inside eh? the truth and the reality you cannot deny it those who are leading you are criminals you may not like me i don't want you to like me and stop being kind of uh what do i call it stop being stop being uh, stupid on social media as well okay i cannot inherit your problem or your enemy okay uh, you should learn never to inherit other people's enemies. If politicians come to you to say you should be careful of uh, Yorubas, you should be careful of egos, you should be careful of uh, Aousa Fulanese, the question you should ask yourself is, if that politician is saying that to you from his own personal experience, I mean experience, must you inherit his own enemy? I don't see egos as my enemy. And there are so many, many, many intelligent and then, uh, good people in Yoruba land that never see an Igbo man as his enemy. But when you begin your politics of uh, tribalism, politics of division that your politicians are feed, feeding fat from, it's not even benefiting you, right? So when you begin that, you begin to remind me that I have to, I have to be careful of this and that. You want me to inherit their enemies, Abi? Some of you have inherited the enemies of dead politicians. Today, you are philosophers because you read the history of dead politicians who destroyed Nigeria, probably when they were alive too. I mean, when they were alive too. So you inherited their enemies. Today, you don't even know which enemy you are fighting. Is the enemy of poverty? or enemy of corruption, or enemy of insecurity in Nigeria. You don't know. You are just fighting blind. They say if you are boxing in the dark, eh, you are just boxing blind. A foolish man will stay in the darkness and be boxing everybody. He wants to fight everybody. He suspects everybody as his enemy. Nigerian politicians live by the sword. They will die by the sword. They killed Nigeria. They will be buried with Nigeria. All of you who are carrying Nigeria on your head. Eh? I don't need to curse you. Nigeria will kill you. And we will talk about you. We will read your story. Okay? Now, let us talk about the real owners of Nigeria. You may not know who you are fighting. You are defending those who should be. It should be stoning, by the way. Well, I know it gets into your nerves. If they are your enemies, I, am, I don't have enemy. I don't have any enemy anywhere. You may not like me. I don't give a fuck about you. Okay, you may not like me. That doesn't make any difference. But I don't have any enemy, and I'm not going to inherit your imaginary enemy in my head. If you are living every day that your enemies are on Facebook, your enemies are here and there, you are a walking corpse, you are a dead man walking. You are dead, you are better dead than alive. Okay, so I don't have enemy, and I don't suspect any enemy. Come to me, I will defend myself. That's who I am, okay? Now, let's go to the real business of the night. The real owners of Nigeria, so many prominent names. You see this story that I'm reading to you all the time. This one I'm reading for you every night. There are events that uh, many, many of you witnessed. Some of us read about them. Some, I mean, I witnessed part of the, part of the whole problem too. But you see all this Indomie generation, these boys who are looking for bros do give away bros who you help those ones who believe that they are entitled to be helped in fact they were entitled to be handed over a working country by the by the, by the criminal politicians they defend the indomie generation they deserve to know that most of the people they see as their heroes most of the criminals who are parading themselves as leaders today some of them that many of this indomie generation are not one thing many of you don't know is this 
1999, the children, Nigerians born in 1999, eh, they are now 21 years old. They are no longer children. They are no longer kids. They are those boys causing trouble on Twitter, on Facebook. With 10,000 Naira, they are ready to sell their soul because they have no clue of what happened or what transpired before they were born. So 1999, they were born into the Nigeria, the fake uh, democracy. Okay, so we need to remind them. We need to let them know that uh, the criminals of today are those who removed history from our book, from our from our from Nigeria's uh, history book. Because those who are supposed to be in the history book as evil people, they are still in power. They are still alive. They still control everything, and they ensure that the truth will never, ever, ever, ever see the light of the day. That is why we need to do this. All the names, it's a refresher, a reminder. Let us get started. The last time we read uh, this last night, it was how Abacha surprised everybody. How Abacha shocked all the power brokers, including MKO Abiola. How Abacha deceived, or let me say tricked Abiola for Abiola to support Abacha. In, I mean, for Abacha, sorry, for Abacha to overthrow Shoneko so that Abacha will then hand over power to Abiola since Babangida refused to hand over to him. That was the trick, the lie, or let me say the game that made Abiola to support uh, Abacha to take over government. What they didn't tell you was that when many people were campaigning and they were protesting that uh, Abiola must be reinstated as the elected president, yeah, Abiola nominated people into Abacha's government because the agreement was Abacha will overthrow Shonekon, then Abacha will hand over power to Abiola. So eventually Abiola died. And then Abacha, Abacha, the real Abacha, eh, unveiled. Now let us continue the story from here. We experienced, and mind you, these owners of Nigeria uh, story that I'm reading uh, to all of you. Uh, is written by Mr. Olusheyi Oduyela, which you can contact uh, on Sheyi Oduyela at AOL.com. For all of you who want to probably just read this through and digest it or download it, those of you are researchers and all of that, you can go to dawodu.com, dawodu.com slash Oduyela. Okay, so if you do that, or you just type owners of Nigeria in, the, in Google, it will bring it up and you can go on to dawudu.com. So the credit for this reading or for this writing uh, today goes to the writer, Sheji Oduyela, and to the publisher, dawudu.com. If you go on Google, you will see it there if you are not patient enough to read with us. Now, let us continue from yesterday. We experienced an unprecedented treasury looting under Abacha like in the in the time of his predecessor while that of babangida was a type of dishonesty honest style abacha went out and went all out looting and maiming babangida, babangida stage managed his own mothers abacha did not wear mask he was very crude in his approach at least we know that Abubaka Atiku Bagudu was one of Abacha's family front. Gilbert Shaguri and his brothers and Alabo, Alabo Graham Douglas. As for Graham Douglas, he was handling an oil exporting company for Abacha, but changed the ownership to his own immediately Abacha died. I wonder why he was not called for quizzing when the Umpadek probe was on, or how he escaped, he was, I mean, sorry, he has some money paid for a job he never executed, running into about 30 million naira. Professor Opia had trusted them as respected indigents of Niger Delta, awarded contracts to them. Graham Douglas, like his other fake contractors, got the contracts with upfront payments and did not execute the project. He became a minister under Obasanjo through Theophilus Danjuma. 
Danjuma disregarded the list sent by the party in the state to accommodate him. Douglas' relationship with Danjuma and Obasanjo dated to the duo's early time in the military when they served in Port Harcourt. Halabo Graham Douglas was the boy who gets them girls then. He has been their boy since then. And that is his older brother. I mean, and that his older brother is Danjuma's friend. Jibad Shaguri and, the, and his family are Lebanese, but powerful than some Nigerians. They make a ma under Abacha. They are so powerful that Abacha kept some money meant for security votes in their care. These dubious Lebanese were the most prominent, prominent contractors. They own the Shaguri and Shaguri, which is the same thing with C and C, the contractor that built the Nigerian Defense Academy. They got the contract in 1992, and as at 2001, they have not completed the first phase of the project, and they got their payment upfront, 2 billion naira. Adolphus Wabara, now Senate President back then, was the chairman of Senate Committee on Defense. He reported back to the Senate and promised to get to the root of the matter, though he was removed by late Okadigbo. But as a senator, he can still pursue it. Unfortunately, no news was aired about it. His successor, a real buna messed it up. I called the company in 2001. I was referred to the agent who now asked to get permission from the defense minister, Lieutenant General Theophilos Danjuma. After further inf I mean, investigation, I discovered that Danjuma was a chairman of Shaguri and Shaguri Investment. This Lebanese owned the big property on Shanusi Fafunwa Street, Victoria Island, Lagos. They are so powerful that Abacha gave them soldiers as guards. The soldiers are drafted from the 65th Mech, Bonny Camp. They guide the Shanusi Fafunwa building, warehouse at Apapa, and also as bodyguards to the Shaguris. This service lasted till I left Nigeria. The late M. Vice Marshal Ibrahim Alpha, another former chairman of the Shaguri and Shaguri, was once embarrassed by the soldiers guiding the building. He was subjected to thorough search one day that he was annoyed and reported to Abacha. Abacha explained to him and apologized. They still remained untouchable in Nigeria. Obasanjo begged them through Danjuma before they could release part of our money kept with them by Abacha. They are into a lot of things. They own Iperia, the internet company, got the Teslim Balogun contract from Marwa. They got the contract of the Igu Square Abuja, could not finish, and Abdul Salami had to give it to another contractor for it to meet the May 29, 1999 and over date. Abu Bakr Atiku Bagudu was late Ibrahim Abacha's friend. He honed up at a court in Geneva, Switzerland, that funds, funds emerged as security votes were diverted by late Sonny Abacha to his sons, Ibrahim and Muhammad, who, let, who later gave it to him for safekeeping. Muhammad Abacha, had from time to time been given security funds by their father and had given me monies from the time to time which had been transferred with the knowledge of the Central Bank of Nigeria through the Inland Bank of Nigeria and Union Bank of Nigeria, Bagudu said in his statement in Geneva, Switzerland. Bagudu claimed that he is from a wealthy family Honing millions, but investigation showed that his father was former director of primary education in Kebi, Bagudu, and the Abacha family set up five corporate outfits. This Morgan Procurement Corporation, 
BVF Mercosta Security Inc., BVI Nigeria Construction Company Limited, Igu Alliance International Inc., Dublin Anabo Engineering and Construction Limited. From the testimony Bagudu gave before the investigative magistrate judge, ju I mean, magistrate, Judge Zekin at the Geneva court, five companies were set up to act as conduit pipes for the looting of Nigeria's treasuries. He started this with the late Ibrahim Abacha, and after his demise in January 1996, Muhammad, the real son of Abacha, took over. Morgan Security secured only two contracts from government, but the, but the money made from this contract was mouth watering. It bought vaccines with $22.2 million in 1995 and the same amount in 1997, but each of the two consignments was resold to the Federal Ministry of Health. In this way, the company made $66.6 .6 million profit from the two deals and the proceeds were kept in foreign accounts, precisely those of Mercosta Security BVI, Igu Alliance, International Inc., Dublin with ANZ Bank, London, England. Igu Alliance International Inc. Dublin was used for buying back Nigeria's public debt. The first value of the bond was $100 million. And the company bought, and the company bought per, per bond worth a total of $472 million. This brought the total bond bought to $572 million. The bonds then were lodged with Deutsche Morgan Greenfield, Jesse, Credit Agricole in Suez, London and SBA Bank, Paris. In January 1998, Bagudu, using a funny, a funny name, Madina, opened an account and the sum of five, I mean five point seven. Let me break it down. In January 1998, Bagudu, using a phony name, Madina, opened an account and the sum of five million seven hundred and ninety thousand eight hundred and eighty-five dollars was paid into the account with the number six with the I mean the account number six one. Five six one five two two three. The name of the bank is Banque du Gotado, Geneva. The fund came from account number eight for I mean nine five seven six nine Kuros with Banca del Gotado, Geneva. All other assets were transferred there between February 6 and March 2, 1998. Between November 1993 and June 1998, Abacha directed his national security advisor, Alaji Ismail Guazo, to withdraw from the, from the Central Bank of Nigeria a total of $1.6 billion and £417 million for security purposes. Interestingly, only £250,000 and $195 million went for that purpose. Sonny Abacha, with the help of Bagudu, diverted the rest of the, rest of the money to foreign accounts. All of you who are hearing about Abacha loot, Abacha loot, this is the story of how Abacha looted Nigeria money. The, those who helped him, where they kept the money, and all the money they are returning to Nigeria from 1999 to date, eh? How all this money flew away from Nigeria while Abacha left the northern part of Nigeria desolate, poorer, and weaker too. But look at the northern part of Nigeria today. They are so happy. Many, many of them think ruling Nigeria is all it takes. Look at you. Look at what Abacha did. This is the history. Let us continue. On Wednesday, 
September 20, year 2000. Ismail Guazo, appearing before a Swiss investigative panel at one of the offices of the National Security Advisor on 24 Mambila Street, Aso Drive, Abuja, offered to release to the government the sum of $500 million before the September 20, year 2000 promise. Guazo had refunded $250 million and $135 million to the Abdul Salami Abubakar government, Abacha's former minister. And Toniani also claimed that Abacha gave him a gift of the hmm, Dutch mark, 30 million Dutch mark for being a lawyer minister. I accepted the gift in accordance with my wife's advice, Shifani said. While the looting was going on, killing was too. 14 young souls were cut down in their prime on 15th of January 1996. Ibrahim Abacha invited his friends to travel with him to Kano for a family engagement. Abacha had told Ibrahim, who was in Lagos to join other members of the family in Kano. Ibrahim, known as a people's man, invited his friends to travel with him. He had on board Fumi, his Yoruba girlfriend, one Dan Princewill, Aliko Dangote's younger brother. All of them made up 15. They almost got to Kano when something happened and they crashed. How did it happen? It was reported that Ibrahim and Dan Princewill had minor bones. They actually died outside the plane. But what is still shocking is the fact that only 14 bodies were found and no one raised question over the whereabouts of the 15th passenger. How would a man plan to kill his own first child? Well, it has been proved that Ibrahim was not Sonny Abacha's biological son. Miriam Abacha married Sonny Abacha with Ibrahim's pregnancy. She was formerly married to Shehu Yaradua's father-in-law, Binta's father. Ibrahim's real father was Binta Yaradua's father, not Sonny Abacha. Attempts by the families of Ibrahim's friends to bury their dead were turned down by Abacha. No reason was given. The Dan Princewill brothers almost lost their lives over this. One of them escaped on the Oron Shoki Expressway when he was pursued by unknown ass assailants. In succession, people were killed. Pa Alfred Rewani was murdered in cold blood in his Lagos house. The killers were able to gain access because they disguised as workers of Parewane from Delta State. It has been reported that someone close to the Rewane family facilitated the killing. The person in question is a close friend of Al Mustafa and also a state governor in Nigeria now. Alaji Suliat Adideji was also killed in her house in Ibadan. Before she was killed, she was stripped naked, and the killers asked her, asked her driver to make sex to her, to make sex to her, that's to make love to her. The driver refused, and, and Sulia was shot from her private part. Why would they kill her? Sources, dis sources disclosed that one Ibadan politi political jobber who felt threatened with Sulia's political stature sold her out. To Abacha. Sulia was, Sulia was in CNC and this old for nothing man in DPN then. I mean, the five fingers of a leper's hand. This is talking about the five political parties formed during Abacha's transition to, to self succession. Sulia was, Sulia was Abacha's family friend since the time Abacha was in Ibadan as GOC, second MEC division. And it was also said that as a nurse, she had treated the Abacha family. According to the sources, according to sources rather, there was something she knew 
about, about Abacha's health condition. And Abacha did not want it disclosed. So she was silenced. This political jobber in his 70s, he was talking about uh, Lamidi Adedibu, the former Amala Begri, Amala Begri politician in, uh, in Ibadan, was a political thug. He was a political thug for the NPN in the Shagari era. Before that, he was a leader of the motor park guys called Area Boys. He has no job, no business except politics. His own politics is shop I shop. It was the same person who facilitated Abacha's death and sold Abiola to Babangida. He made it possible for Yaradua to win the SDP primaries in 1992 in the Southwest, beating Olufalaye and Olabi Yidrojaye. Mama Teju Osho, mother of Oba Dapo Karunwi, or of Okeono Eba, was killed in her 80s shortly after her birthday. Why? Her son was to take Abiola out of Abuja after the RNG court bail organized by Oladipo Dia. Obakaru Wi was a member of the Constitutional Conference. The plan was to arrange a bail in whatever way for Abiola after his arrest, at least to get him out of detention. Obakaru Wi was to pick Abiola from Dia's quarters for Abe Okuta and from there out of the country. But Abiola was advised by some people not to accept the bail because it was conditional. Information leaked to Abacha and Obakarongwi paid with his mother's life, just as Dr. Olu Onogorua lost his first son, Tony, because he facilitated Tona Oboru's bail, Oboru's bail. And that was why they attempted to kill Alex Ibru. Alex Ibru was the internal affairs minister who ordered the immediate release of Tona Oboru's after a court order, after a court ordered his release. With the help of Latif Shofolahan, Alaja Kudira Tabiola was killed. In fact, Mustafa was mad with Rogers and others because they didn't rape her before killing her. They shared 50,000 Naira after completion. 50,000 Naira for person's life. The media suffered a great deal under Abacha. Many journalists were arrested and detained. Kunle Ajibade did not believe he was under trial and thought Aziza was joking when he sentenced, and when he sentenced him to life for his alleged involvement in the 1995 coup. Chris Anyangu was also arrested in connection with the coup. But it is not certain whether whether it was because of a publication on the coup or a alleged relationship with the main man arrested for the coup, Colonel Lawan Guadabe. Bayo Nonuga, editor-in-chief of news, was arrested twice, taken to Aso Rock, but escaped with the help of General Ladipu Kodia. He later left the country. Baba Femi Ojudu was not as lucky as Dakwa, Olorun Yomi. Ojudu had traveled out and was coming back through Ghana when he was arrested at the Seme border. He was a guest of Colonel Frank Omenka for nine months. He met, he met Tokumbo Fakeye, group defense correspondent of the news magazine at the time, at the Directorate of Military Intelligence, Papa. Tokumbo was picked at Bonnie Camp. He was there for nine months. Deli Omotunde was arrested and spent six months in detention. Nosa Igiebo of Tel was not spared. Fatai, the publisher of Rezo magazine, was abducted from neighboring Republic of Bene, locked in the trunk of a car, and kept in dungeon at the DMI in solitary confinement. I do not have to mention the case of Shivgani Fawaimi and other human rights activists. Yaradua was arrested for the 1995 coup. Before his arrest, Yaradua sponsored the motion that Abacha must leave by January 1996. He did this using Bami Banabas, Gemade, and Tonyanini. But soon after his incarceration, the duo Banabas, Gemade, and Tonyanini 
became Abacha's campaigners. <laughs> Yaradua did not wait to see the end of Abacha. Obasanjo was lucky. Were there cool in 1995 and 1997? Who masterminded, I mean, who uh, masterminded them? The caliber of people arrested for the 1995 and the circumstances surrounding their arrest and the way the trial went showed the kind of mess, shame they put the Nigerian military intelligence to. Under Abacha, the army intelligence was divided into three factions. The Abacha faction coordinated by Ibrahim Sabo, Mustafa, and Frank Omenka. The Ishaya Bamayi's camp, headed by Colonel Ideren, and the traditional and professional group that remained neutral throughout the mess, headed by Colonel Dari, retired. Colonel Dari succeeded Sabo as the director of Army Intelligence, DMI. He left when Guzo started his overbearing attitude. The other two groups engaged in spurious intelligence gathering against one another. Hmm. Funny enough, those arrested for the 1995 coup plotting were not commanders of any brigade. At least, about two of them were lawyers. Colonel Ajayi, who was implicated in the coup, in the coup was Ishaya Bamayi's deputy at the Lagos Garrison Command, now 81 Division. Bamayi had asked Ajayi to change a one retired colonel's rank to lieutenant colonel as at his retirement to reflect that the man got involved in the coup because of frustration that he was retired as a lieutenant colonel. Ajayi refused and he got listed in the coup. It is on record that many military personnel lost their commission under the leadership of Ishaya Bamaji as chief of army staff. Many officers and I mean, and other ranks were sent to Kirikiri prison. For minor offenses after a kangaroo court martial, I mean, sorry, court martial with a predetermined destination and decision, rather. These fine officers were retired before their, before their time. They were trained never to, never allowed to give back to the nation what they learned. They lost in the world they knew nothing about. Was General Adipupo Dia actually planning? To Topu Abacha in 1997. Was it a setup, as he claimed, and the Syria loan project? Stay tuned for Abacha's final part, which is the part eight that I am going to read uh, to all of you right now. Let me take a break. It is important. And then uh, we will continue in a moment. Thank you very much. So let's continue. Let's continue. Uh, this is the final part about Abacha and the role that led to uh, when Abacha died. How we go to 1999, the game they played that uh, brought in Obasanjo, the likes of Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, and the likes of uh, Atiku Abubaka. The Atiku Abubaka that later became Olusegun Obasanjo's uh, deputy for eight years. How oh, the journey to 1999, how that started, what, what led to what would be the next, uh, uh, the next uh, reading. Thank you very much for spending your time with me again tonight. Uh, let's take it on. <laughs> to my friends on YouTube, I hope you are actually uh, very clear on YouTube as well. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time. I know those uh, uh, fans on, the, on Facebook are doing fine. We are very good on uh, Facebook. So let's take it on. Before 1994, Abacha believed that to succeed, the Yorubas must be carried along. He saw the wisdom in choosing Lieutenant General Oladipo Dia as his deputy. Initially, Dia 
like Colonel Abubakar Omar, Lawan Guadabe, and other young officers who believed that the military had stayed too long. Abacha saw this and used their interests in June 12 to turn them against Babangida. It worked for him, and to consolidate his position, he got all of them retired. Dia was needed to get the wide, wide west under control until 1994, when Dia's own people failed. There was this ultimatum issued by Nadeko then. Abacha believed that they would strike, but it turned out to be ruse, and Dia lost influence. Kokori was arrested and detained in Borono State. The West lost the creation of Ijebu State, but they won Ekiti State. Because the likes of Olumilua were practically sleeping in Abuja to commiserate with Abacha after the Kano plane crash, he did not allow Ijebu State. Because that was the bedrock of Nadeko, Senator Abraham Adesonya, Chief Ayo Adebanjo, Sa Ajayila Nehu, Otumba Biyi, Durojaye, and others are from Ijebu. To Abacha, it was not safe to create a state for his enemies. Dia became a suspect, and fellow Yoruba were used as spies on him. They visited him several times, wired to get something on him for Abacha. Dia became a source of wealth for many of them. At least, one of the ministers from Ibadan played that role. Ari Shekola Alao did, and a publisher of a magazine who hails from Iworo Iwo did. Dia himself did not help situation. Most Yoruba officers who would have been close to him were retired. Olatuji Olurin remains the only officer who went to Ekomog as a commander, though as, bri as brigadier, but assumed the duty of a major general, but was not confirmed. He was retired as a brigadier general. Colonel Kemi Peters also confirmed that Dia dist I mean, distanced himself from Yoruba officers, and he paid dearly for it. But he had Tajuddin Olanrewaju, who was Minister of Communications. Olanrewaju still has a case to answer on the contract he awarded after the Ikeja Nitel exchange was destroyed by mysterious fire. After the fire incident, contractors submitted bids for the repairs. Three communications, com three communications companies applied, two non-European and one American. There were $85 million, $45 million, and $15 million bid. The highest got it. Sources disclosed that the list which was four, or, I mean, four, sorry, which was a $15 million would have made a profit of $5 million meaning that the actual cost would have been $10 million. The contract was awarded and to date, Ikeja Exchange has not recovered from the fire problem. Nothing really changed. I lived in Maryland for three years and I experienced the problem. It was under Abacha that Aibe, Victor Ombu, and Ibrahim Ogohi perpetuated the smuggling of petroleum products from Port Harcourt and Wari to neighboring West African countries. Between the month of June and December 1996, Nigeria lost a total of 202,130 metric tons of petroleum products to smuggling with the connivance, the connivance rather, of Rear Admiral Mike Ahigbe, Victor Ombu, and Ibrahim Ogohi. What is worrisome about this illegal diversion is the magnitude of the product involved and the fact that over 90% of the product were diverted abroad to Kotonou, Abidjan, and Ghana by unscrupulous opera operations. According to the reports, within a span of six weeks, about 15 vessels 10 vessels per month 
disappeared undetected with such a large quantity of the nation's wealth. What led to the arrest of seven vessels in August 1996 and which became the eye-opener for the Naval Operation Unit was the interception of a telex message sent to Ghana on one of the illegal transactions. The telex dated August 23rd, 1996 was confirmation of the delivery of gas oil MIN 2,000 metric ton to maximum of 2,500 metric ton. It was addressed to one Mr. Kato Brownie and Kwasi Amankona Hine, one Peter Tata for Transfigura Limited, signed the, te the telex. The vessel Amorex is owned by Transfigura. Loaded in Okrika, mafia behind oil bunkery in Nigeria, the Nigerian military connection, August 26, 2013. It's a report. I've told you guys about uh, those behind the uh, oil bunkery, oil smuggling, and the rest of that in Niger Delta area of Nigeria. They are the retired soldiers. They started it under Abacha. They started this oil subsidy nonsense under Abacha. And those who are behind it, they are those many of you found and saw as uh, honorable Nigerians, criminals that you give or not to because you allow criminals to rule over you. And that's the problem, by the way. In the month of October, 16 vessels that loaded petroleum products with a total of 25,800 metric tons, 8,700 metric tons, and 28,600 metric tons of PMS, petrol, DPK, and AGO were diverted. This time, two vessels were specifically said to be notorious, MT, Radar, and Orion. The report indicted these operators within the movement industry. The report also stated that the BFOC East NNS Okemini was directed to monitor and escort MT Radar and MT Orion carrying 3,000 metric tons of DPK and 2,000 metric tons of AGO to the destination of the general area of Bakasi. Due to some mysterious reasons, NNS Okemini did not comply with the Ref B. Consequently, the vessels disappeared unescorted, the report stated. The flag officer, Air Force East, Commodore VK Ombu, now a retired chief of Nava staff, was directed to arrest the Nigerian Navy personnel, personnel involved and investigate the matter. He did not. Rather, he arrested the vessels and left the personnel. The COP recommended that the CNS carry out full-fledged investigation in the interest of the security of this country, the good image of the Nigerian Navy, and indeed, that of the other security operatives involved in, enf in enforcing uh, security in our maritime environment is stated. Now, let's go on. That's for the looting, the, 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 the bunkery that they introduced into the oil business in Nigeria. In some of the memos of the COP, Rear Admiral AOS Okoja, Commodore Victor Ombu, and Commodore Ibrahim Ogohi were mentioned severally for disregarding directives from the chief of operations, and most of the laxities were placed at their doorstep. For example, in the case of MT Radar and Orion, where Commodore Ombu, Air Force East, was directed to arrest and investigate the naval, I mean, the naval office and personnel involved in the illegal diversion, he was said to have arrested the vessel instead, leaving the culprit and never investigated them. Even when he was asked to send the vessel to Lagos, he refused issuing counter-directive that the vessel be detained in Okemini. The, the FOC West then, Commodore Ibrahim Ogoi, was said not to obey directive from the COP. So that is to tell you about the indiscipline within the military rank then. That's just for that. While attention was focused on tankers being driven across the border to neighboring countries, the real smugglers 
were having swell time on the high sea, transferring the nation's wealth and plunging the rest of the country into serious hardship. It was reliably gathered that what was lost within the period of June and December 1996 was more than what was discovered. There's a coup uh, uh, about uh, against uh, Tejan Kaba. We are not interested in real that. But uh, there's something that happened in that story. It has to do with Ken Saruwiwa. I'm going to read it. After the killing of Ken Saruwiwa and other Ogunis, it was apparently it was apparent that Abacha had pitched himself against the whole world. Nigeria was suspended from Commonwealth. Abacha was confined to Abuja. He could not travel out, to, uh, travel out of the country. He needed to win back the support of international community. So what should, he, what should be done? The Ekomog had succeeded in ensuring the enthronement of uh, Tejan Kaba as the democratically elected president of Syria alone. And uh, there seems to be peace there. The idea came that Johnny Koroma should be allowed to topple Kaba and be driven out again. Then reinstall Kaba. This, according to Abacha think tank, will work and project him as a pro Democrat. After the civil war, Nigerian military personnel were in control of the security of both the Liberia State House and Syria alone. They formed the bulk of the security there. Charles Taylor got wind of the plan to topple him, and that was why he insisted then that. Nigerian troops should leave Liberia. Signal was sent to Freetown that on the night Koroma will strike, all armored tanks in the state house be disabled and the soldiers should not return fire. On that night, Koroma men made inroad easily to the state house and Tejan Kaba was thrown out. While the coup was going on under the watchful eyes of the Nigerian troops, apparently taken to orders. Another troop in Liberia was ordered to move into Freetown to stop the coup. The Nigerian commander in Freetown was not aware of the counter order. This was the team led by late Brigadier General Maxwell Kobe. Two officers used to carry out different orders by same directing authority. This almost cost them their lives and the lives of the troops sent. sent. Why this was going on? Late four day, Sanko was in detention in Nigeria. He was lured into Nigeria by someone who was managing the Nigerian refinery in Sierra Leone and, um, and uh, an arms dealer, by the way. He was a member of the House of Representatives in 1999 to 2003 from Imo State. I want to leave the rest for now. Let's talk about the coup, the Bamayi's coup. Ishaya Rizi Bamayi, a course four officer of the Nigerian Defense Academy, was made the chief of army staff over his seniors like Abdul Karim Adisa and others. So to retain them in service, they were posted out of the army as ministers. Bamayi, before his appointment, never respected nor recognized Awal Kazir, his predecessor. Bamayi is a man with tall ambition. Abacha did not favor him, but Dia did. Why? It is Dia alone that can answer that. So it is the same monster created by Dia that consumed him. Ishaya Bamayi is a man with many features and it is the one he wants you to know that you will know. No sooner had he assumed office than Mustafa discovered that he had an ambition to succeed Abacha. Bamayi, as the chief of army staff, wreaked more havoc on the Nigerian army than any chief of army staff before and after him. After him, he stole so much money that one of his boys, a sergeant, went away with seven hundred and fifty thousand naira meant for one of his prostitutes. Bamayi ruined one lady's wedding. The lady in question is Yoruba. A day before her wedding, Bamayi sent her and I mean sent for her and raped her. I would be groom had to flee from her to save his dear life. 
The lady visited him in detention at the Kirikiri Maximum Prison. Two officers were to be killed, but we were miraculously saved. They are Igbo officers and still in service. The Igbo officers, rather, still in service. At the time when focus was on him, that is Bamayi or Bamayi or whatever you want to pronounce him as. At the time when the when the fo when focus was on him, with his plot to unseat Abacha, Bamayi saw a good shield in General Dia. He approached Dia with the demands of officers on political detainees. Most importantly, MKO Abiola, knowing too that Dia had spoken against Abacha's self succession bid, Dia became his alibi. He sold the idea to Dia, gullibly, or Gadia bought it hook, line, and sinker. Towards the end of the year 1997, Abacha sacked some of his ministers with the aim of reconstituting another one. Adisa lost his work announcing minister portfolio. Olan Rewaju did too. But Abacha's plan was to remove Bamayi as the chief of army staff and make Adisa his new chief of army staff. Bamayi got wind of, of this from his boys planted within Abacha's setup. So he went to Dia and advised him to discuss the coup with Adisa. In the military, if you, hear, if you hear about a coup, about a coup plot, and you fail to report it, you are as guilty as the plotters. Dia called Adisa, told him. But when Adisa knew of those behind it, he warned Dia. But Dia inter interpreted that as cowardice and accused Adisa of bootlicking in order to become chief of army staff. Bamayi went back to Abacha with a recorded tape from Dia. It was then that Abacha knew Adisa had been informed. He waited for Adisa to come and report, but Ab Adisa never did. He reported Adisa to Arishikola Alao, who called Adisa. Adisa eventually went to Abacha but did not tell him anything. On his way out, Abacha called him. Karim, are you sure you have not, I mean, you have not forgotten anything to tell me? Adisa's response was negative. The focus now shifted from Bamayi to Dia. But Bamayi's plan was still intact. The Dia school was a decoy by Bamayi, by Bamayi a diversion. To Mustafa, Sabo and other members of Abacha's camp, Dia did not plan any coup. It was Bamayi. It was Bamayi's idea. If not for Brigadier General Ibrahim Sabo, Bamayi would have taken over power on December 20, 1997. His plan was for Dia to be taken away, killed in action, while he descended on Abacha. Mustafa was to be killed first. According to their plan, if Abacha is out of the way, then, I mean, yeah, if, if Mustafa is out of the way, then Abacha becomes vulnerable. Sabo spoils the show. The Abacha camp saw the wisdom in roping the coup on Dia after he escaped the bomb attack along the airport Abuja. Ari Shekola Alao and Bamayi were to lead Abacha's entourage to Dia's house on condolence, I mean, on condolence uh, visit. They were at the airport that day, but it didn't happen. Dia's girlfriend, Ayo, had warned him. She got the information through a former military governor of Akwai Bomb State, who was later arrested and tried with Dia. It was the night of the bomb explosion that Dia knew and accepted that Abacha wants him dead. Unfortunately for Dia, he had his official quarters wired, and it was discovered that it was to leave for Lagos after that Sunday en route Republic of Benin and then came, came after him that night. So, uh, and they, they, they came after him that night. Did Dia actually cry? Did he truly defecate as claimed by Sabo? It appeared funny that an intelligent, I mean, as intelligent as Mustafa is to forget that Dia defecated at the villa 
and it took Sabo to remember that. How strong would it have been that it would require Julius Badger to fumigate the villa? The argument of, the, of defecation came after a question was raised on the different appearances of Dia on the video shown. Dia, Dia appeared in two different dresses. His voice not audible in the videotape too, while that of Adisa was clear. After the special investigation, Frank Omenka disclosed to Dia that, Oga, you are alone here. Bamayi and others have been released. It was at Omenka's instance that Bamayi was summoned and questioned by Lieutenant General Victor Malu. With evidence, Bamayi would have been convicted, but for Abacha, who had another plan for Bamayi, Omenka became Bamayi's enemy, and after Abacha's death, Omenka was retired. There is another group with a different agenda, and it was to get rid of Abacha. So it was a good thing that Dia was incarcerated, because if Abacha dies, Dia would have succeeded him. But their own, their own candidate was in prison. So all the parties worked to remove Dia. The death of Abacha was not planned or hatched in, an, in a day. It was on for long. And their tactic, their tactic was scientific. They used the information bought from one of Abacha's marabout uh, scouters, an old man from Ibadan. When Abacha came, sorry, when Abacha came in, his marabout had warned that one of, one of his girlfriends would be a vehicle for his death and an Igbo, an, an Igbo girl. Incidentally, Abacha's favorite was mentioned. Abacha did not want to lose her. So he sent her abroad. She lived all that while abroad. But at a point when this Ibadan man, when this Ibadan man lost favor with Abacha and was broke, he sold out the information to the group that eventually masterminded Abacha's death. Husseini was Abacha's best pal and partner in crime. It was used indirectly without him knowing. They worked on the girl to insist that she wanted to come back home. And they worked on Husseini to prevail on Abacha to allow the girl to come home. Their plot was to rope Abacha's death around Husseini's neck thereby disqualify him from succeeding Abacha. Since after Dia, Husseini was the most senior officer, followed by Abdul Salami Abubakar, who had remained invincible and silent in Abacha's government. Just a moment. The lady came and some Indian ladies too were organized as diversion. The Igbo girl, eventually came home and was lodged in Nikon Hilton Hotel, Abuja, same place where one of M.K. Abiola's wives was lodged. With the help of the Ibadoman, they placed Magun on the lady. This is interesting, by the way. And then uh, Magun is a strong Yoruba medicine to track promiscuous women. Uh, whoever sleeps with a woman with Magun will not survive it. This is more potent than any intelligent report Stronger than Sergeant Rogers and all body guys at the house number seven, where Abacha died. Magun has no leg. It is invincible, but very potent. General Sonny Abacha was in high spirit, seeing his girlfriend after many years of separation. Bid his friend Jerry Boy a uh, uh, good night and went in with his girlfriend. After meeting the girl, he fell and somersaulted, I mean, somersaulted three times. He died under the watchful eyes of the body guys. But neither Mustafa nor doctor could save him. He died even before sleeping with his uh, expatriate uh, prostitutes. To Al Mustafa, Husseini orchestrated Abacha's death because he wanted to take over. That was the impression they gave him, and he fell for it. With Dia in detention, Husseini branded as Abacha killer. The road was clear for Abdul Salami Abubakar, apparently the heir. Abacha was number one, Dia number two, Husseini and Abubakar number three and four. This is according to military seniority. This was where 
Mustafa was demystified. With all his five years of security network and serious intelligence gathering, it came to the fore that most people who surrounded the dark Google, uh, dark Google the general were feeding on him. Mustafa failed his boys at the last minute. He fell and Abacha's empire collapsed like a pack of cards. Mustafa thought Babangida was on their side until he was posted out of the villa to 82nd Division in Enugu under Major General Oladayo Popola. It was a setup. He failed the litmus, litmus test and was arrested and detained. That was the beginning of his journey into, into Pasha incarceration. Omenka, he miraculously got out of the country. Sabo was spared. Why? When Obasanjo was taken to, in, to Inter Center at Ikoi Cemetery over the 1995 coup, he was thrown in a room on a bare floor, no carpet, no bed. Sabo, as the director of military intelligence, was on a tour of the detention center. And he was the, I mean, he saw the Otafama in the sorry condition. He believed the general deserved better treatment. He knew there was no coup. So he ordered that Obasanjo's room be equipped with a bedding, refrigerator, and carpet. At least it made the Otafama to live like a very important detainee until his transfer to Yola prison. Sabo is now a member of the PDP. The news spreading then was, was that one of Jerry Husseini's boys, a lawyer and a lieutenant colonel, was the one who went to India to bring the expatriate prostitutes. And that, that was why he was retired after, finding, after findings of a panel set up by Abdul Salami Abu Bakr government. The truth is that the man in question Lieutenant Colonel Nandap was not retired because of any finding. There was no investigation. He was retired with some other officers, two brigadier generals, because their panel set, sorry, the panel uh, set uh, Colonel Kemi Peters uh, free. Colonel Kemi Peters was mentioned in the December 1997 coup, but escaped from his house in Lagos. He stayed abroad until after Abacha's death. On his return, General Ishai Abamayi ordered his arrest and set up a court martial to try for a wall. That is uh, a way without official leave. But throughout the period of Colonel Peter's disappearance, the army under Bamayi never issued such warrant on him. In fact, the army was paying his salary. The charge of a wall could not be proven by the army, so the martial court set him free. Bamayi was mad. He ordered that all members of the court be retired compulsorily. compulsorily. Uh, Nadab was uh, unlucky as he was just uh, on the waiting list, blah, 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 blah. And uh, of the brigadier general, one of the brigadier general was one of the best medical doctors in the army, but he was retired by Bamayi. Alaji Atiku Abubaka, his rise and uh, seeming fall. Next on Owners of Nigeria. Thank you guys for your time with me this evening. Remember, uh, history is not meant to imprison you. You are not meant to be, to be imprisoned by your own history. You are meant to learn from them so that you don't repeat them. That is why we need to read our history to ourselves. Uh, they are not, uh, you know, everything I've read to you is an account of an investigative journalist who saw through the period and was able to put all of this uh, into writing for all of us to read today. I will continue this reading tomorrow. And that will be part, eight, part 9, part 10, and the closing part, part 11. And that will be the end of the reading. Until the next one, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. On Facebook, on YouTube, you guys have been, uh, you have been great. So I will see you next time. Have a very good evening from this side.
Yeah, he was it. Oh, my 